All right. Very good. Okay. Well, welcome everyone um, to our bird of the month uh, uh, for this month. Uh, we're pretty excited about it, actually. Um, uh, we uh, usually like to start out with the segment just pointing out that our bird of the month um, uh, series continues to focus on North American species. Uh, each month, the information on the featured species will cover the description, the range, the habitat, food, and reproduction. And we generally like to put this in at the start of our presentation because um, we occasionally have new members, new viewers, and uh, just to keep everyone on the same page. All right, our bird of the month um, is the wild turkey. And uh, I actually requested this. Um, you know, we uh, had put the offer out there earlier in the year uh, for our members to select the species that uh, they would like to learn about. And it covers all of North America. And uh, so I decided to toss one in there. And I thought the most appropriate one for the month of November would be the wild turkey. An absolutely beautiful bird. Um, I don't know of anyone, uh, whether they're a birder or not, that isn't familiar with the turkey. Of course, most of them are familiar with uh, it, with meeting it on our Thanksgiving day and uh, making their introductions at that point while they pull the bird apart. But uh, one of my favorite times to enjoy the species is actually seeing them in the wild. Now, I know most of you are probably not aware of the fact that there are actually only two species of turkey, one in North America and the oscillated, which is in Central America. Now, the North American species is actually divided into five subspecies. There's the Eastern, the Florida, which is the Osceola, the Rio Grande, the Mirian, and the Goulds. All five of those are actually subspecies but they all exist here in North America. Generally, the birds are quite large and plump, especially the males. Males get to be about 46 inches in length. The females about 37 inches in length. And uh, as you can see from our first uh, picture here, they're absolutely beautiful, especially during the early spring when the male uh, gets all his colors those uh, fleshy marks on uh, uh, appendages on his neck and head, uh, those are wattles. And um, the bird generally is considered uh, dark overall with a bronze or greenish sheen. Um, this iridescence really uh, highlights the birds. Um, in, a, in addition to the large bulky body, notice how comparatively speaking, how small the head is and that long neck. They do have long legs as well. And uh, just an absolutely beautiful bird. Look at the tail on the bird, which is really prominent in the male. Um, we put together a schematic here so that uh, you guys could get a better look at um, identifying the, uh, the, the sexes. On the upper left, we have the hen which is also called uh, the juvenile bird, the juvenile hen, I should say, is called a jenny. And uh, when you look at that hen, you can see uh, some uh, distinct differences in it. Uh, she, the hens generally don't have the beard, which is that tuft of feather that sticks out from the breast area. You can look over to the upper right and see uh, the male by comparison. That little fleshy appendage on the nose of the turkey is called a snood, S-N-O-O-D, the snood. And it's actually filled um, with blood vessels. Uh, they can actually move that snood around quite a bit. And it uh, grows, it extends quite a bit on the male um, during the breeding season. The uh, schematic there below, the, the lower right-hand side is the gobbler, that's your adult male. And to the left of the gobbler, we have the jake, which is the juvenile male. Um, notice also the feet of the birds. Uh, the female uh, does not have a spur. 
whereas the males do. So if you should see the birds out wandering around, that's one of the, the key field features you might want to look for. Also, again, as I mentioned before, that beard. Now, most females don't have them, but occasionally you will get females that do have them. The Jake there, you can see his beard is quite small compared to the adult male, the gobbler. Uh, that beard is much, much longer. Um, also, one interesting feature about the bird, looking at the tail, the adult male or gobbler fans his tail out and it's pretty even all the way across. Whereas in the Jake, the center feather tail feathers are longer than the outside tail feathers. So uh, that's one way in which you can actually distinguish uh, the sexes as well as give some semblance of the age of the bird. Um, these birds are spread all throughout North America with the exception of Alaska. So all 49 states, which of course includes Hawaii, has the, uh, the turkey. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the ones in North America, uh, that is one species made up of five subspecies. And then there is the oscillated uh, turkey, which is in Central America. Um, the range is actually uh, quite spread out. And because it's so expansive throughout North America, obviously these birds occupy quite a large variety of habitats as well. Um, let's uh, take a look at some of these habitats. They, um, they range uh, anywhere from the uh, far Western states to our far Eastern states. And so anything covering some of the uh, arid desert regions with uh, some grasslands involved all the way to our lush eastern seaboard with lots of uh, different kinds of uh, mature forests abundant with nut trees like oaks and hickory beach interspersed with edges and fields. Also the birds are showing up far more now in suburban areas because of hunting uh, that took place many, many years ago, the wild turkey population had actually declined significantly. But due to reintroduction efforts um, over the years, the populations have bounced back quite a bit. When I get to my conservation notes, I'll cover that topic a little bit more. Um, as far as their foraging, I found, a, a, actually CC found a really nice schematic here that gives a, a good example of some of the foods that the turkeys uh, um, have a preference for. Nuts are definitely at the top of the list, especially acorns and things of that sort. And then uh, fruit, seeds, worms, snails, uh, large insects, plants predominantly uh, um, are the uh, major part of the diet. And of course, uh, gallinaceous birds like chickens and uh, quail, pheasants and otherwise, they actually do ingest quite a bit of grain for helping to grind the uh, cellulose, uh, plant material and seeds, nuts that they eat. Uh, that sand and gravel is held in the gizzard, which is where the, the food is ground up. They will also take small reptiles like uh, uh, lizards, small snakes, and occasionally the, an amphibian like a small frog if they can get to it. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as feeding, these basically are ground dwelling birds. They spend quite a bit of the time on the forest floor as well as in uh, uh, open fields near cover. They will spend quite a bit of time using those strong, powerful legs for scratching. Now, when the birds are alarmed, they are capable of running quite a bit. What's interesting is between male and female, when the birds are alarmed, the females tend to fly short distances where the males typically prefer to run uh, for cover. Their uh, uh, plumage enables them to blend in so well with the habitat they occupy that it's very, very difficult to find them. And so 
for the large percentage of hunters that set out about this time of year to go turkey hunting, they are actually challenged quite a bit in actually locating these birds. Something else about the birds too, is that their sense of hearing and their eyesight is absolutely phenomenal. Now, even though these birds spend uh, uh, most of their time on the ground during the day foraging for food, they do roost in trees. And so what they will do is fly up uh, to the lowest branches and then hop to the highest branches that they can find. They group, uh, they stay together in generally in large flocks. Um, now, one of the little side notes, flocks of turkeys are actually called rafters. That's R-A-F-T-E-R-S, rafters. And so it's either a flock or a rafter of turkey, just something you can uh, challenge your friends with to see how much they know. All right, in regards to breeding, uh, it generally takes place in early spring and uh, the males get quite vocal and very active. They usually are drawn to clearings in or near their forested habitat. Uh, where they do, the males do uh, quite a bit of gobbling to attract females. The gobbling, however, works also to tell uh, adjacent males that that dominant male is occupying that particular territory. And so the, the gobbling here is twofold. Males will actually copulate with several females during the mating season. And once the females have been copulated with, they generally drift off to find uh, nesting areas in the forest. Uh, the nests are ground, uh, uh, placed on the ground. There are shallow depression lined with any of the leaves and vegetation that the birds find locally. Uh, generally 10 to 15 eggs are laid and the female is the only one that actually incubates these eggs. Occasionally females will dump their eggs in the nest of another female as well. So it's not unusual to find a hen once the chicks have hatched after the 25 to 31 day incubation period. Uh, a hen may be walking with 15 or 30 uh, chicks <laughs> as a result of other hens laying uh, their eggs in the nest of the occupying female. Now, the chicks are precocial. By that, I mean that soon after they hatch, they're able to actually get up, walk around, and leave the nest. When the hens are laying their eggs, they will lay the egg usually about one each day or every other day, but they actually don't start actively incubating those eggs until the entire clutch is laid so that once the chicks hatch, they all hatch simultaneously. Uh, there is obvi obviously um, a survival advantage to that occurring. And so once the chicks hatch within an hour or so, the hen takes them and leads them away from that nest. She will actually brood them at night um, uh, for the next several weeks until uh, the chicks are able to actually get up in the trees as well. Um, these chicks are able to fend for themselves. The female leads them to food sources, but she actually does not feed them at all. They are able to fend for themselves. Um, and here uh, it, the, um, uh, is a photograph of what the birds would look like in the fall. Now, this particular group is a bunch of uh, hens, usually the hens with uh, both adults and juvenile hens uh, of the year will spend the winter together. The males um, will actually form all male flocks. And uh, so they actually don't come together uh, until the springtime. In regards to conservation, wild turkeys are numerous and their populations increase sharply between 1966 and current, according to the North American Breeding Bird Survey. Partners in Flight estimates a global breeding population of 7.8 million with about 89% in the United States, 10% in Mexico, and 2% in Canada. Wild turkeys uh, regained 
and uh, ever and even expanded their range after dramatic, uh, drastic declines during the 19th and early 20th century, surviving in small groups in the wilderness areas of the Gulf states, the Ozarks and the Appalachian and Cumberland uh, uh, plateaus. Another subspecies uh, disappeared from part of Texas, while yet another declined precipitously in number throughout the Southwest. Um, uh, and just uh, closing with some interesting facts, in the early 19, uh, 1500s, uh, European explorers brought home wild turkey from Mexico, where native people uh, had domesticated the birds centuries earlier. The English name of the bird may be a holdover from um, early shipping routes that passed through, uh, lost my place here, that passed through um, uh, where am I? Uh, I lost my place here. It passed through uh, um, the the country of Turkey, actually. Um, let's see. The uh, male wild turkeys provide no parental care, as I mentioned er uh, earlier. Newly hatched chicks do follow the female around. Um, the wild turkey numbers dwindled through the early 20th century. People began to look for ways to reintroduce this valuable game bird. Initially, they tried releasing farm turkeys into the wild, but those birds didn't survive. In the 1940s, people began catching wild birds and transporting them to other areas, and such transportations allowed wild turkeys to spread uh, to all the lower 48 states plus Hawaii and part of Southern Canada. Um, uh, on average, the wild turkey uh, lifespan is three to five years. The uh, domestic turkey um, is about 10 years. And one last thing, a lot of um, people uh, think that uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, actually um, wanted to have the turkey um, uh, as our national symbol instead of the bald eagle. I found out through my research, however, that that uh, is false. The, uh, what Benjamin Franklin referred to, he wrote a letter to his daughter claiming that the early drawing of a bald eagle looked like a turkey. And so he didn't care for the drawing at all. And so that's where people um, got the idea that Ben Flanken actually preferred the turkey. He admired the turkey. He thought that it was um, a noble bird compared to what he said about the bald eagle being a thief and that it was lazy and preferred to steal fish from other birds as opposed to catching its own. But he actually did not have a preference for the uh, turkey over the bald eagle. All right, and if you guys have any questions, um, I'll be more than happy to cover them. I apologize in advance for the length of this, but um, you can tell I really enjoy the turkey. Okay, okay. Uh, that was great. Um, and that was such an interesting fact about George Washington and the, I mean, Ben Franklin and the, and the, and the kind of mistake and idea that we have about the bald eagle and the turkey, which one yeah. should be the, American American bird. Uh, right. So, if you have any other questions, if you have any questions for Claude, please put them into the chat. We do have one question. Uh, uh, Kevin Baker said a turkey got stuck inside his pool patio screen porch when the door was left open. <laughs> and as God is my witness, he says, I have a video of it flying a short distance over my canal after it got out. So <laughs> the question he asks is, how well do they generally fly? And do they lose their ability if they get too big? No. Uh, <laughs> well, typically wild turkeys, because they spend so much of their time foraging for food, they never really gain the weight that you would find in our domestic birds. And so they maintain a very trim uh, uh, figure, if you will. Uh, <laughs> and so they are capable. They're actually very strong flyers. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, they do roost in trees. They actually fly up in the trees to roost, but 
Um, so they never gain the, uh, the weight that we see with our domesticated birds. Um, we have another question and that is, um, so um, how often does the turkey actually fan its feather out? And, and this is from Phyllis Strain. I'm, I'm actually curious about this too. Do you know how often they, they fan those beautiful feathers out? It's, it's, it's done by the males and it's done predominantly during the spring breeding season. This, the fanning of the feathers, the tail feathers, the drooping of the wing feathers, fluffing of, of its body, it's all a part of the courtship ritual that the males use to, uh, in addition to the vocalization, the gobble, to attract the female. So the more they prance around and do a lot of go gobbling and uh, flitting the tail, the wings spreading the tail, all of those in combination seem to work together to attract the hens. Do they ever use their fans like, um, like the, um, um, what, what am I thinking? Anyway, do they ever use their fans to like ward off to show their, 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 their size to ward off other birds or animals? Yes, all of that works in consort um, to keep uh, less uh, or submissive males to to the bigger, more dominant bird within a particular clearing. All the males, for the most part, seem to seek clearings, uh, which is sort of their strutting ground. Uh, and they do a lot of calling at those places to bring other birds in, uh, especially females. Um, but again, yes, they, they will actually uh, use the, the fanning of the tail and all of that too communicate with uh, with the others. Great. And so uh, Jeannie Mauser says she's never seen or heard, she's never heard of people eating turkey eggs. So I guess the question is, do people eat turkey eggs? No, generally they don't. Um, usually when the hunters go uh, hunting, um, the head is what they aim for and that drops the birds right away. Uh, the domestic birds are never sold once they are prepared um, and placed in the, uh, um, for market, uh, you never see the head with it. So there's really nothing to eat on the head anyway. Egg. Okay. Egg. Okay. And so, uh, I, so the question was not Did head. Did you say I, the head or the no, or no. eggs? I, I said the eggs, Clive. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said the head. Eggs. No. Um, I have never heard of anyone eating turkey eggs. Um, it, it, I wouldn't put it past some people to do so, especially farmers who do have uh, keep these birds. A lot of the folks around here in Loxahatchee, where I live, uh, do keep turkey. And I would suspect that uh, they do eat the eggs, uh, especially for those who have only, only hen turkeys. I would suspect that they do eat the eggs. Well, Clive, you're going to have to do a survey and, 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 and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be careful to let you know the result. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Marianne, Marianne Gable uh, asks, uh, there was a group, or, or lets us know, there was a group that they think were introduced near Great Basin National Park, and she saw a couple of them tumbling down a hill there. So that must have been quite a sight. And quite a sound. And quite a sound. <laughs> they were tumbling down the hill? Yeah, I swear they were fighting with each other or something. Ah, yeah, yeah, just going rolling down. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. That, that will happen amongst males. And even outside of the nesting season, there's a pecking order that the groups, the flocks will actually establish. So even with the uh, all male flock or rafter, I'm trying to teach you guys a new word, or the all-female flock or rafter, uh, they will occasionally jostle because there's that pecking order that they're trying to establish. Right. It was quite a smackdown. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Clive, in Palm Beach County, where one might one see rafters of turkeys? <laughs> I, I would suspect uh, up north. Uh, we've gone uh, birding up by, um, uh, what was that? Three lakes. Three lakes. In the Three Lakes region, we've gone out there birdie. And each time we've gone out, we've actually seen turkey. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Central, North Central, 
Florida, places like that. Yeah. And some some of the uh, 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 people on the uh, Zoom meeting tonight are saying plentiful in Corbett area, JW Corbett area. Right. Uh, also at Riverbend, where I have actually seen them what, a, a couple of times. Uh, I saw, and I also saw them just once at Okahili South. The, really? Uh, yeah, oh, one okay. time I saw, and, and it was just a single, a single hen there. Yeah. That, and there may have been more, but as soon as she saw me, she wanted nothing to do with me. And yeah. I never saw her again. And now that uh, you mention it, I do remember seeing a turkey, wild turkey at Riverbend. You're absolutely correct. I have seen them there, and I know for for a fact that Corbett they do have them as well. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Helen and Scott Lawrence say many turkeys at the campground in Lake Assimi State Park. So oh okay yeah okay. and Very again observed in River oh Grassy Waters Restoration Area as well really yeah really? so we do have them around that would explain the one bird I saw uh, <laughs> just kind of walking through my neighbor's yard earlier this year, um, it was a hen and definitely a wild turkey, not a domestic. And uh, so, yeah, the closest population I could think of to where we're living is at Corbett because we're about two miles away from Corbett. Yeah. Well, Clive, I have no more questions. Uh, that was a turkey of a presentation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, Clive. Thank you so much. You're uh, very welcome. We yeah, enjoyed we it. Yeah, we always learn so much from your from your presentations, and we learned a lot about the wild turkey uh, this evening. So we're going to go on now uh, and go to our feature presentation for the evening. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can get uh, the 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 picture of them. Uh, let's see, let's see where, where it is. Okay. Uh, so our featured program tonight, uh, I'm going to let uh, Marianne Gable introduce it, and I'm sure you're going to, you might hear just, you might hear something about the wild turkey, because I suspect that might have been part of their big year. Marianne, take it away. Great. So tonight we have the pleasure of introducing some very special and popular presenters, and that is birding, or I should say birders extraordinaire, Natasha Fontaine and Robert Gundy, not Gundry there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So in 2020, they set out to beat the 2019 Florida big year record of 387 species. And I think by now we all know they did. And I'm not gonna talk about that, but let me give you a little background on Natasha and Gundy. Natasha Fontaine uh, is an illustrator of plants and birds, a photographer and a graduate student in biology at Florida State University. Among her many talents um, and pursuits, she developed an interest in recording birds since working as an assistant at the Lottie Lab at City of University of New York Queens College. And then later in 2017, while attending a workshop at Cornell Lab of Ornithology Sound Recording. Natasha also has a passion for herbaria and collecting plant specimens. Her master's thesis, which she is defending in a short two weeks, <laughs> is focused, as I understand, on understanding plant diversity and distribution to assess bird habitat associations for conservation management. All right, did I get that right? I hope. Okay. Now, Robert Gundy, who prefers to go by Gundy, is a Florida native and lifelong biologist by both infatuation and occupation. He's worked with birds, reptiles, plants, and invertebrates, and considers himself a naturalist with broad interests in the living world. Currently, Gundy is a field biologist for Florida Natural Areas Inventory at Florida State University. His future plans would have him working in a position that directly benefits wildlife conservation and local communities. And he dreams of working in the Caribbean or Latin America. So, but tonight it's all about their love of birds and let's hear about their great adventure. Please welcome Natasha and Gundy. Thank you so much for that um, really nice introduction. <laughs> Uh, let me share, uh, I'm going to share the screen and we will get started. Let's see. 
Okay. Do you see um, just the presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, well, we don't have to introduce ourselves because Marianne just did a fabulous job. So we're just going to kind of jump right into it. Um, I guess maybe you can take, you know, maybe 30 seconds to kind of read the little little bubbles that we have here on the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, kind of answering why you would do a big year or maybe not. <laughs> okay. Oops. All right, so we're going to start off with uh, the first winter, January through February. Um, so we really didn't start, the, we, we didn't start the year saying that we're going to do a big year. So we were in the Everglades and we just spent New Year's camping in Everglades. And um, we were really just birding. And our first bird that we had of 2020 was the Black Crowns Night Heron. And that was at 12.01 a.m. So um, you know, we heard it at night <laughs> and that was our first species. Um, and then so basically uh, for the rest of the day, we didn't, like I said, we weren't really doing heavy birding. Um, so we ended up with 61 species on the first day. Um, and then, you know, we came back up to North Florida and doing our regular birding, um, the American Robin became our hundredth bird. And um, so we don't have a picture of the American Robin. <laughs> it's a really common bird, but this is a prime example of, even if it's a common bird, you should document your species. <laughs> so this is just a kind of a FYI, if you're thinking about doing a big year, common birds matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, did we skip something? Okay. So that was lesson number one. Make sure you take pictures of common birds. Um, so, sorry, whoops, I'm having a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so this here, once upon, what this story here, once upon a time on an airboat, um, Gundy basically was out doing field work and um, his, he was doing a, sur a plant survey as well as snail survey and a snail kite survey. Um, out in Paynes Prairie, and um, he was going to be on, a, out on an airboat all day, so he asked, you know, hey, do you want to come during the day? And me being from New York and not really, you know, spending too much time in Florida, I was like, yeah, I'm going on an airboat, <laughs> so of course I'm going to go. Um, so I went and accompanied him while he was doing field work, and while we were, um, we were all among the, in the prairie, um, in places that most people are not um, allowed to go to. Um, while he was doing his surveys, we were out there um, taking lots of photos and so forth. And as we were going around in the airboat, we hit this spot, which was just this spot of like open water. And it was almost like we hit a tornado of snow kites. It was amazing. We got into this little cove area and they were flying and foraging all around us. As you can see, with, we got all these wonderful photos and I got a recording, which I definitely wasn't expecting to get. And I also definitely didn't think a snail kite sounded like this. <laughs> Such a weird, Cool, <laughs> but that was one of our uh, really early on, really exciting uh, experiences. Okay. So we spent the beginning of the winter chasing tropical birds down in South Florida. Um, that was our plan for the, the first week of the year, just for fun before we ever thought we were doing a big year. Uh, so some of the ones we got were brown crested flycatcher, which is normally found around Texas or Central America. Uh, Lasagras flycatcher is another Caribbean species, and uh, thick Mulberia was a, a long overnight drive to the Keys, um, and uh, those are also a, a Caribbean species. And then the other part, the other birds that we were chasing in the winter were western birds. 2020 was a killer year for western birds coming over to Florida. Uh, we got Hammond's flycatcher at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, which was a second state record. And we met another big year birder there while, uh, while getting that bird. And then at my old fishing haunts, Lake Worth Pier, we got a Hearman's gull. So if you look at that photo on the right, up at the top, on top of the building is actually the Hearman's gull staring down at us as we have lunch. So, so we got a selfie with one of our rare birds. Yep. <laughs> 
Um, do you want to do this one? Um, okay, yeah. So this one here, we so one thing that we learned doing this figure is that big year birding can't happen without a birding community. That's just the bottom line. And especially the way we were doing it, where it was that we could really only bird during the weekend. Um, you know, we made so many connections with people all over the state and, you know, people who had these amazing birds coming to their bird feeders in their yard. So we got word about this guy that had this hummingbird in the yard and with regular, with regular visits from this Rufus hummingbird and a black chin hummingbird. Um, so of course we're like, yeah, but we need to go over there. We reached out to him, really nice guy. And, you know, we went over there and ended up getting the Rufus and the black chin hummingbird within how long was it yeah, like, like under five minutes under five minutes yeah. we just we got there went out in his yard and next thing you know boom boom they're both there and it was like all right this is fantastic <laughs> super cooperative as you can tell by the photos um really nice um and then also um we talked about saint mark's earlier uh we had the vermilion flycatcher at saint mark's um, which was at the time a regular visitor. Um, and we were pretty lucky to see it in um, because it hasn't been seen since 2020, right? They didn't recite yeah, it. Yeah, no, there was yeah. no reciting recently of it. So um, yeah. it was kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, that, that individual <laughs> bird had been returning to St. Mark's for about 10 years. Yeah, so uh, we were lucky to see it that last year. Uh, so it's winter and we're in North Florida, so we chased northern birds uh, for a good part of the winter. Um, the Nashville Warbler was randomly in a yard in Tallahassee yep. and we were wandering around the neighborhood because we didn't know what house it was at. We just knew what neighborhood it was in. We wandered around and here come the homeowners walking their dog and then invited <laughs> us into the yard to come see the bird. Um, we also got this black-headed gull, which is uh, less than annual in Florida um, at this really cool place called Okaloosa Holding Ponds. If you're ever in the panhandle, you should check out Ogre's yeah. Holding Ponds. And then uh, a snow goose at Mayaka River State Park down in Southwest Florida. Okay. And so in late January, we start to go, wow, we're, we're really picking up birds fast. Um, we didn't yeah. know what the pace should be like. Um, by mid-January, we'd already decided to do a big year. So by the end of January, when we hit 200, we were pretty stoked. We were really excited. Like, wow, this is this is going so much faster than we thought. Yep. Um, it uh, it slows down quickly after that. <laughs> um, so then we're moving into spring migration, and uh, so our, our favorite migrant traps for spring migration. We don't know what a migrant trap is. Um, these are locations that are usually right up against the water, where birds, um, as they're coming across the Gulf of Mexico will just drop down to the first piece of land that they find if there's um, less than optimal weather conditions, like if they're facing a strong north wind or you know, if, if you get really lucky, a, a big tropical storm or something hits and, and every bird that's coming to the coastline has to stop like at the first piece of land you can. Uh, so those are some of our favorite uh, migrant traps throughout the state. Um, I don't know if uh, Palm Beach County is known for, for having fallouts. I think that's mostly a Gulf Coast kind of thing. Um, so yeah, at Veterans Park, one of our, a new spot like that we discovered from being in, doing the big year in um, Okaloosa, Okaloosa County, um, man, that place, it's like serious warbler neck because they are just, that park is so small, but it's so loaded with birds. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So we had a black loaded green there. We had bay breast warbler and cerulean warbler, which was a really unexpected, but very special uh, moment. Um, and of course, more warblers in Okaloosa Veterans Park. Um, actually, this one here, we had the worm eating warbler and the gold ring warbler, but the pathonotary warbler is actually at Otter Lake, which is uh, part of St. Mark's. Um, so we have that up here. Um, also a really cute park, not super productive, but when it comes to pathonotary warblers, it was pretty good. <laughs> um, this one here, uh, Kentucky warbler, we got uh, locally up at Eleanor Clap Phipps. And so it was really singing its butt off. I was happy because I love my recording. <laughs> so I'll play a little bit of that.
And so this was a really nice bird because it was just cooperative. We got into the park, maybe like within 10 minutes, we hear it in the distance and it kind of was staying in the same area and just singing. So we were just like, just follow the song. <laughs> so that was really nice. Um, okay. Uh, back to Oka Okaloosa Park, Philadelphia Vario and Scarlet Tanager. Uh, once again, it's a small park, so you get really close. So that's really nice. Um, you can go ahead with this. Uh, so some other non-warblers from spring migration were a bank swallow, uh, super fortunate to have a bank swallow just sitting yep. on a, a handrail. Um, and it actually was also next to a northern rough wing, and they're very similar. So that was a fantastic side by side comparison. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got that bobo link at Sweetwater Wetlands Park. Um, well, we got a bunch of them that day, actually, yeah. uh, in Gainesville. And uh, one of the, the cooler birds, I think, for spring migration was Connecticut warbler. Uh, neither of us had ever seen a Connecticut warbler, and in one week we saw five. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we saw three in uh, in uh, Southwest Florida in the Sarasota area. One at Lantana Nature Preserve there in Palm Beach County with Richard Crosley. Yeah, that was, um, cool. that was really, cool. <laughs> really nice of you. Really yeah. nice guy. <laughs> uh, um, and another one at uh, St. George Island in the Panhandle. So. We went from, from zero in our life to five in a yep. week. <laughs> and Richard Crossley. <laughs> yeah. um, and then that Magnolia Warbler was a, another one at Leper's Key. That Leper's Key was a really surprise spot. Um, I, you know, growing up in Southeast Florida, I've been around sea grapes my entire life, but I had never seen songbirds in sea grapes before. And on the Southwest coast, it was just amazing. It was packed, packed with warblers that were migrating through and other birds. And uh, then we had yellow-throated vireo that was up in uh, Clay County, and uh, probably the only time we've seen Swinsons and Great Cheek Thrush right next to each other, that was up here near Tallahassee, too. Those were really cool. Yeah. Um, that was an extraordinary day for me. I saw, I think, over 100 th uh, individual thrushes in one late morning of birding, which, I, I mean, maybe 10 is the best I'd had before that. Okay, so on April 20th, we hit number 300 with the Viri. So um, the Viri is really special to me because growing up, I guess I would say that I've always been birding without knowing that I was birding. Um, so I'm, I've always been a big listener. And so my family from out of New York City, we used to go to the Catskills to go camping and, um, you know, while camping, I would hear this amazing sound coming from the forest. And it took me, you know, years and years later until, you know, I got into actually IDing and realizing like that amazing childhood song that I was hearing this kind of ghostly sound from, from the woods was a very, so this was a really special uh, bird for me. Um, okay, and now summertime and the birding is easy. <laughs> so, the magical place called dry tortugas, I'm pretty sure that all, many of you know dry tortugas, of course, um, but for me, you know, it was, it was a magical place. And once again, going back to my childhood, you know, I watched a lot of nature on PBS. Um, that was my Sunday evening routine. <laughs> and um, a lot of these birds that were at dry tortugas that we got to see, for me, they were considered TV birds. And so what I mean by that is just, I see these on TV and when, you know, as a kid, I'm thinking, when am I ever going to see this bird? Probably never. So it, it, this was an amazing trip. Um, so we had Max Booby on the left and Brown Booby um, and uh, City Turn and Brown Naughty. Um, so that was fantastic. And I got really great recordings of City Turn and I got recordings of Brown Naughty, which was also very un unexpected. Um, and this is a great photo here because the Black Naughty is right next to Brown Naughty and you can really see the difference in size and you can really see the difference in color for the most part. Um, I don't think that, well, we both don't think that the black naughty should be called black naughty. It should be yeah. chocolate naughty, yes. dark, dark chocolate naughty and brown naughty. No yeah. chocolate and dark chocolate naughty because yeah. that black naughty is not really black, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a fun uh, story too. So while we were driving to our two goes, um, it just so happened that a bunch of other birders went the same day that we did. Mm -hmm. It was only the second trip that they were taking to drive to our yeah. two goes after COVID had started. 
Um, and so a bunch of birders got on the same trip. We didn't know that was going to happen. One of them was a friend of ours, Kevin, mm -hmm. and he was on top of the fort. And I yelled up to him. I was like, hey, you see anything cool up there that you know I can't see from the ground level? And he goes, oh, well, inside the fort is a short-eared owl. <laughs> What? And so I just laughed it off and kept walking. But then I thought to myself, you know, I should ask. <laughs> Kevin, you're joking, right? <laughs> no, it's sitting down here in the, in the grass and the really? grasses. <laughs> so we ran inside the fort and sure enough, just yep. sitting under some cabbage palm fronds, there's a short-eared owl. Yep. Looking cute. <laughs> Turns out there's a Caribbean subspecies of short-eared owl. And so it actually made sense that it was down there. Yeah. Um, this was a really cool bird. Uh, this glaucus bull. Uh, was at Huguenot Memorial Park, which is in Jacksonville. Um, I think that was the only one that showed up in the state all year. And it literally walked right up to us. Mm -hmm. We like kept our distance yeah. and we're taking photos. And it just walked up to us like it was begging for food. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, apparently there's a gold guide coming out. And that photo will be uh, in that gold guide later. Um, so hopefully that comes out soon and I can see my photo and some somebody's photo. <laughs> Um, so this is a really great story for a lot of reasons. Um, so um, the South Polar School showed up in Alabama and for us, you know, we, I've never seen one and he's never seen one. So we were like, you know, it's not in Florida. It's not going to count for us, but let's just go, you know, go across the border here and see if we could, you know, get a nice lifer. So we go over, lo and behold, no bird. So we're like feeling a little defeated, whatever. And so uh, Gundy decides, well, you know what? When we get over the border, let's just stop at the first place that we can get into. And um, I forgot the name of the place. Uh, Perdido Perdi Beach. Perdido Beach, yeah. So um, so we've pulled in and, you know, we decided, you know what? We didn't get the bird. We're just going to make it like a fun beach day and whatever. So we have all our equipment, scope, cameras, binos, and we set them on the sand and we go in the water. Next thing you know, we're like, all right, we get out the water and we're kind of like chatting and stuff. And he looks up and he's like, the look on his face is kind of like, what is going on? So that made me look up and both of us together see this huge bird fly right above us. And we were like, that's the bird. So mind you, we didn't have our equipment. And one thing about our big year is that we really wanted to document every species. So it's like, like the bird is in Florida and it just flew by us and our equipment is over there. So we run to get the equipment. He boats in front of me. I have my stuff and we're running, right? We're running and literally the beach, everyone is partying <laughs> because they're like, we don't know what's wrong with these people, but they are running and something is happening <laughs> and so people are grabbing their kids like get out the way <laughs> and so we're booking he's in front of me and lo and behold I fall okay because I am not like a sand runner I fall he's like what's going on like why are you slowing down and I'm like just keep going I see the bird right <laughs> save yourself so he goes he keeps going and he starts taking shots of the bird, this, that, whatever, it's on the shore. Then it goes into the water. I finally catch up. I explain to him, my knee is like, my, my ankle's busted. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just keep doing it. It's right. <laughs> and then so bad, you go in the water. So, so then it, it goes offshore and it just sits offshore a little bit in the sandbar there. And that's me, you know, the, on the left there, you see the photo of me in the water. Um, and that photo on the right is not cropped. That's how close the bird flew to me. Right it, there. It <laughs> um, so yeah, it was, it was it pretty was, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was an amazing experience. And then we would see a bird from the South Pole on a Florida beach in the summer. Yep. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a really cool one. We were down in, uh, in Homestead at Lucky Hammock, and we were actually looking for Willow Flycatcher. Didn't find that bird that day, but just as we're birding and walking around, we hear this call. And I knew immediately what it was because I had seen them in Bolivia yeah, before. I never, I never heard them. And so I was just, like, I look at them and I was like, you guys start recording. Start recording. That's an honest. That's an honest. <laughs> <laughs> so she records and then we eventually like walk to the bird 
And it actually lets us get within like 30 feet of it. Yep. <laughs> and it just forages down low in the grass. And so we got this photo, we got her awesome recording. Yep. And that, yeah, that, that was a really cool experience. Um, and that bird was a one hour wonder. It was never seen again. Yeah. We didn't see it later or the next day. Um, so we got really lucky with that because we had a lot of other unsuccessful Ani chases. Um, oh, so ABA Countable Established Exotics. Um, so for big years, there are birds that count, which are you know all the native ones that are on the American Birding Association checklist. But there are also birds that are count that count that are exotic birds that have established populations. And so some of those are the scaly-breasted munia, which we got in Pensacola, but also got in Miami. Um, we got red-whiskered bulbul in Miami and spot-breasted oriole in Miami, which we saw a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, the spot-breasted oriole was on my birthday. That was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then it gets, so that's the end of the summer for us, and it gets into fall migration again. Um, so yeah, we had a friend that told us that at when you hit 300, that things get really hard. And we were like, are you kidding me? We got this. <laughs> I was like, 300, we're past that. I'm like, we're fine. Um, but nope, that was not true. <laughs> so um, it was uh, September 11 when we got this golden crown kingway. I'll play it. It's really low. So you're going to have to kind of tune in if you can. So this was actually a yard bird for us. Um, and how this happened was, like I said, things were really difficult right now. We were physically drained, emotionally drained. You know, I'm drained from school. He's drained from work. I mean, we're just drained. And it was just at a point that our spirits were really low. And it was just, it was just a time that was like, man, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> it was just hard. And we had to make the decision of, okay, we only have a few more months left. We are on this amazing track. We're at 350 on September 11th. We went through all of these months of the year already. You know, what do we do? Do we just give up now? Do we just toss it up? And basically we were thankful that the birding community was really helping us emotionally. And just like, you're right on the track you were so close just keep going and so that that really kept our spirits up by like just different people sending us private messages and so forth and so that was really good and this bird we actually ended up getting one of the rare moments that i was taking a nap in, a, in the middle of the day which was weird um <laughs> and he was working because you know it's cold with working from home and uh we basically he heard it first through the window and i woke up like wait a minute was that and he was like, yeah, I think so. I grabbed the recorder, ran outside, got the recording. So um, it was a nice yard bird. It was a tough time, but we, we pushed through. Oops. Okay, flycatchers. Oh, yes, flycatchers. These are, these are tricky birds. Yep. Uh, so there's an alder flycatcher on the left. Um, we were able to get those down at Lucky Hammock. Um, that was a cool experience. That was also my birthday, so another fun one. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got Cuban Kiwi and, and Big Pine Key, which was like, I think, the eighth record in yeah. the country because they've all shown up in Florida. Um, and then I decided Flycatcher, we had unsuccessfully chased several times. Every time we went, they were one day wonder birds. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that one afternoon, well, actually, like one late morning, somebody rep uh, reported this all decided Flycatcher a couple hours away from us. So we, uh, we immediately left right then, just like in the middle of the day, middle of the work day, just said, okay, well, cutting the day short, we're going for that bird. Yep. And uh, it's a, it was a really interesting story because when we got there, I had to go to, I, we had just <laughs> drove, driven for like three hours. I had a 32 ounce Gatorade and I had to get rid of that Gatorade. And so we get there, the bird's not there. I'm like, great, let me go to the bushes. Nope. Sure enough, while I'm in those bushes. There's a bird, there's a bird. I can't make it come out any faster. I was like, hey, come on, what's here? Luckily, the bird stayed there. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, Brewing Wood was an interesting one. We kind of, we, we kept not going after Blue Wing Warblers that were reported locally because other rare birds came up. 
And so eventually we're like, okay, we have to actually chase a blue wing warbler. Yeah, so which was ridiculous. So we chased in Gainesville. They had 10 there the week before, yeah. none, and they were never seen again in Gainesville nope. after that. And it wasn't until we went down to Key West for the red-legged thrush mm -hmm. that we picked up blue winged warbler in Key West. So a bird that we could have gotten five minutes from our house, we got nine hours away. And we did get <laughs> it this year, five minutes from our house. Yeah. <laughs> so. And uh, Wilson's warbler, we unsuccessfully chased a hermit warbler at Spanish River Park down in Boca. But we got Wilson's Warbler as a, a wonderful consolation prize. So, like I said, we're super tired. We're in North Florida. And all of our chasing has been, you know, south. Um, this was one of those rare weekends where we were like, wow, it's Friday and we're not cooking and packing the car and getting ready for an overnight drive. So we're settling in. Well, next thing you know, why would we be settling in? <laughs> 7 p.m. and we get a phone call that says, hey, the boat leaves tomorrow at 6 a.m. Where are you? What do you mean, where we are we? We're at home, right? So 6 a.m., we have to get to Miami. We just look at each other and we're like, this is the first pelagic that we could get on. So it was like, we have to get there, okay? So we pack, whatever, we get in the car, another overnight drive. I don't know. We got there like four. Four in the morning. Yeah, we got there like four o'clock in the morning. Boat's leaving at six and, you know, fine. Whatever, the usual. Get on the boat. We get out to sea. I have been on boats before, but I have not been on like this kind of a boat before. And these, these were five to seven foot. Seats. I was fine. I was like, yeah, I can handle this. This is no big deal. I get on a pelagic. No biggie, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it was like after 30 minutes, I was like, uh oh, something's happening in my stomach. I don't know, but I need to keep looking for birds, right? <laughs> so I'm like having this dialogue inside myself. And I'm like, with people that, you know, I've never met. So I'm like, oh boy. I don't know what's happening to me right now. And next thing you know, I start puking and I am so sick. I am so sick. I'm just like vomiting like terribly. And then so they catch winds. And so we have to see the bird, right? Both of us. So I need to, I need to be like alert. Okay. But I'm vomiting right now and it's not stopping. So we see, they catch wind of, um, uh, long tail Diego. Right. And they see it off in the distance. So then our captain starts hauling the boat. And I'm talking about speeding. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Right? So we're chasing this bird. I'm puking. They're looking for it. I'm passing out now, like in between. Of, like, I'm closing my eyes because I'm just exhausted. And next thing you know, just for whatever reason, I open my eyes for that quick moment in time and I look up and they are looking off in the distance for that bird and there is a Jaeger right next to the boat. And all I do is I point up and I'm like, it's right there. And I just go right back to throwing up. <laughs> so it was um pretty tough pelagic, but we did get some yeah. good birds, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the second winter. So, you know, we, uh, since it goes by county year, we have two winters to burn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this was a really cool one, a savings goal. These normally breed high in the Arctic, and they actually migrate out over the ocean. Well, they, they come across part of the U.S. and then migrate down the ocean. And so they're very rarely ever seen in Florida, even though they pass us by. And somebody reported one eating their fishing bait at a pier near Cape Canaveral. And that bird stuck around for a while and it was flying as close as could be, just like any other laughing bird that, you know, has been there year round. And there you can see it on the bait cleaning station as it was trying to steal bait from fishermen. Yeah. And, and I, you know, in my mind, I'm like, we're going to go get a go. So I'm not going to bring my recorder. I left the recorder in the car. Next thing you know, the gull is flying, like he said, right above us. And I'm like, do you hear that? The gull was vocalizing. So I was like, I'm getting the recorder. Ran to the parking lot, got the recorder, and got a little bit of a nice recording here. And that's only like the third or fourth recording ever taken in Florida for yeah. that species. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. So we're... we're we went down to Key West to chase a number of birds, including this common eider, which is the southernmost record of common eider that's ever happened. And 
We did not find it at any of the places it had been reported through the week before. And so we tried the spot. It was last seen a second time at the end of the day as the sun is going down and Natasha spots it. And as soon as she spots it, it goes under and it doesn't pop up again after five minutes. So we happen to have the kayaks on us. <laughs> so we pull the kayaks off the car, throw them into the water, paddle frantically out into what suddenly out of nowhere became choppy seas, Crazy. which in the keys, I don't know why there's choppy seas. <laughs> and we paddle, 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 paddle. And then it just pops up like right in front of our kayaks. We didn't even need to get in the water. Um, that photo on the right is taken from the kayak. Photo on the left is taken from the pier where we launched the kayaks yeah. about five minutes after we got the kayaks out of the water yep. as it swam under the pier that we were actually standing on. Yep. Um, so yeah, we got two Longville Carlos, which is great at Cedar Key. Um, this is really nice because we, this is one of our least hectic times. Uh, we ended up renting a pontoon. I've never been on a pontoon before. So he was driving and I was chilling out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had the scope set up and everything and we're just, you know, out there and we, as you can see, the water was beautiful. Um, I caught a flounder with a piece of kielbasa. Um, so that was fun. So that was really nice. And just getting those lo two long built curlews, being able to watch them forage with oyster catchers and ready turn stones like in calm silence was a really nice time. Um, yeah. The last bird of the year was the bird we tried for the most times. Yep. And it's a bird that lives in Florida all year round. <laughs> it was the mangrove cuckoo. We tried at least 14 times for mangrove cuckoo through the course of the year. We tried in Sarasota because there was a random one that showed up there, in Miami, in Naples several times, in the Keys. And it wasn't until December 30th at Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge in Sanibel that we finally got mangrove cuckoo. Yep. And that was our last bird of the year. Yep. Number 388. All right, so some of our favorite birds, we're gonna run through these quickly because we're running out of time. We'll just yep. show you the nice pictures. Uh, there was a first state record, Scott's Oriole, that was a lunchtime bird for us. That was really cool. Yeah. Same with the Western Tanager. Uh, the Lesser Nighthawk, we were one of four people four. that got mm -hmm. to see that bird at St. Mark's. It was a one day wonder that was never seen again. Yep. Those two photos are the only two photos we got, and one of them happened to be diagnostic. Yeah. <laughs> um, great Shearwater is a bird that means a lot to us because uh, that was the first double lifer that we got as a couple, and we're actually the only people to have ever seen one in, in Wakulla County, Florida, so that was cool. Yeah. Uh, the South Polar School was really cool because it's a school in Florida, and because we kind of sort of found it ourselves, we were the first people to, to find it in Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, so Magnificent Frigate Bird, that's one of my fantasy TV birds, so that's always going to be a special bird for me. And then the American Flamingo, our pinky up at St. Mark's, um, that, uh, we got that on our anniversary, so that's also a special bird for us. <laughs> um, Florida Scrub Jay and the Red Breasted Nuthatch. Because the Nuthatch is so cute. Yep, the Nuthatch is really cute. <laughs> Also found in a really cute, small, unexpected location. <laughs> so, yeah, like a five-acre yeah. park in the middle of the neighborhood. Yeah, but really nice. Um, okay, least favorite birds. Like I said, we'll try and go really quick here. <laughs> there it is, excited for this. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Um, so I am usually prepared of clothing. I am fine in the cold. Being from New York, it doesn't bother me at all. But this day, we usually try and get... Um, you know, more than one bird, chase more than one bird. And so we were looking for a report of um, the Western Meadowlark, which was in a landfill, but never came to fruition. And we were also looking for a Harris Sparrow in Washington County. And so Gundy, he cleaned the car out, which is fantastic to prep for one of our weekends. And he cleaned the car out really well. <laughs> um, <laughs> to the point that none of my gear was put back in the car. So I had no extra boots, no extra pants, no extra shirt, no extra anything. Because as we go on the weekends, we always had extras of everything just in case, you know, rain jacket, whatever. But, you know, he did a great job. He cleans everything out of the car and had nothing in it. So that's why I'm wrapped in a blanket while burning. Um, <laughs> so least favorite bird, Western Meadowlark. Thank you, but no thank you. <laughs>
Uh, Townsend's Wonder is yeah. one of two birds that Natasha and I differed on. Yeah. Um, I was able to go chase this bird when Natasha's schedule wouldn't allow it. Yeah. We had tried for the bird four days, uh, two two day weekends basically. Mm -hmm. We spent two days in a, I don't know, maybe five acre park in Sarasota. We at one time actually had the people standing next to us see the bird, and we didn't see the bird. Yep. They're like, it's right there. We're like, no, it's not. <laughs> and, um, it was an extremely frustrating bird. So I ended up actually finally getting it. Yeah. Um, greater white fronted goose. There's one that hangs out at the Key West Golf Club year round in Florida. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's right yeah. there next to the fence. No, it's, it's not. So easy. No, it's not. We it's were not. in Key West three <laughs> times and didn't get into our fourth time there. It is not in, in late December, right before Christmas. Yep. Uh, Bo Swift was in um, Gainesville. Was in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. That is the most underwhelming lifer you will ever have in your life because yep. you're just sitting there waiting for them to dive bomb out of the sky into a chimney, and that's it. Yep. It's a it's Don't. a fraction of a second bird. Don't blink. Okay. These are fun. Craziest places we slept. So there's our tent Christmas Eve in mm -hmm. a KOA campground in Titusville that uh, fine. we're just going to keep it short since we're running out of time. It's basically a bunch of meth heads and feral cats. Yes. <laughs> Don't go there. It Don't ever go there. Mortifying. The sketchiest place we have ever camped. I've had 400 nights in a tent in Florida. That's the only time I was scared for my safety. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Oh, other stories. Uh, we slept on several beaches. Mm -hmm. That's really fun as long as you don't have equipment coming to scrape the beach off at sunrise, that's scary. That's when a, really when scary. A, an actual bulldozer <laughs> drives by you in the, in the night. That was scary. Uh, we slept under a bridge in the Keys at one point. Yep. Uh, and for my birthday, we had a friend who brought a big, gigantic like Walmart tent that fits like 12 people. So we just put our tent in that, but then he didn't put the rain fly on that day. And a huge sudden thunderstorm came by and we all slept in a puddle. So we actually slept in a puddle, in, in a, a tent, tent, in, in a tent. tent. Um, uh, so that wasn't so fun, but the fishing trip the next day was great. Yeah. And uh, there was also one time in the Keys for that Bickville video that we tried to sleep on the side of US-1 in the Keys, and a police officer kindly told us at 4 o'clock in the morning that, that we were not allowed to do that. We shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but he did tell us where we could go sleep. Yeah, he was very nice about it. <laughs> uh, so rare birds this is a second state record Hammond's flycatcher second state record mountain bluebird first state record Scott's Oriole something like the 10th or 12th state record black faced grass quit that is actually Natasha's uh, um, side mirror that it is standing on very uh, friendly black faced grass quit yep. <laughs> one of the reasons I had to clean the car is because that grass quit actually entered the car and started feeding from it so we knew it was time to clean the car <laughs> <laughs> but put my things back. <laughs> that thing of the rush, third record for the country, Cuban Peewee, eighth record for the country. And then there are actually, these are not rare for Florida, but globally yeah. rare birds, mm -hmm. uh, whooping crane and Florida scrub jay, which we know is endemic to the state and should be our state bird, wink wink. Yeah. <laughs> uh this is all natasha <laughs> so favorite recordings um seaside sparrow this was really great because they're just right there in a the marsh and and just singing <laughs> um this one was really uh one of those moments where um i was sleeping in the car and i i'm one of those people that sleeps with the recorder I don't know if, well, that's probably not very normal. Um, <laughs> so, I, camping or whatever, and even sometimes in the house, depending on the season, I sleep with the recorder right next to me. And I was sleeping with the recorder, and we were driving, we were in Everglades, and he pulls over, and we hear this Chuck Will's widow, and next thing you know, I'd like groggy, just turn on the recorder, get off the car, and skip the recording. And this one here was at Huguenot when it was actually when we got the Glaucus, um, Glaucus Wink Gull. Um, and uh, there was a bunch of oil turns there. So it was just really nice to be able to observe their behavior um, and just get this fantastic recording.
So I'm going to jump in front of Natasha here. If you happen to go check out your Merlin Bird ID app, that's the, one of the recordings they used for Royal Turn on the Bird ID. <laughs> Natasha has several recordings that are hers that Merlin used. He's always blowing me up here. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Favorite photos. Yeah, we'll just run through those real quick. Yeah. So, so these are just, you know, most of our photos are just crappy photos just to get the identification of the bird, but some birds were nice enough to, to be nice and close and let us get some nice yep. shots. So here's some of those. Yep. And enter your stats. He's a stats guy, so all you. <laughs> <laughs> so we got uh, 386. Natasha got 386 birds. We, we differed by two. Um, I got 388, which beat the record by exactly one. Uh, we we did but, have to, yeah, we had to throw out several birds yeah. that were convinced we got, but our mm -hmm. evidence wasn't convincing, and so we went ahead and just dropped them so that you know our integrity level integrity level was high and we wouldn't be questioned on anything yeah um but they were painful drops yeah. <laughs> uh so they were painful 395 e-bird species so some of those didn't count towards the big year things like you know like swans in a lake yeah and, you know certain birds that just didn't count for aba um we got 374 of the 388 had some sort of documentation, whether that was photos or audio. Um, 18 species that we only got audio for, 10 species that were ABA code three, four, or five birds, um, which means they're, they're ultra rare anywhere in the ABA area, which is uh, the US, Canada, and Hawaii. Um, eight species that we only saw in people's yards. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that's an example of how doing a big year's uh, birding is a community-wide effort. Can't be done without other birders letting you know where the birds are and hopefully letting you on the properties to get those yes. birds. Um, and we had seven species that were heard only that we never actually saw them. And if you want to check out our list and our photos, we made a spreadsheet um, at that URL there, where you can see all 388 species, and there's links to the eBird checklist that have the audio or the photo or the description. Um, and there's a couple other little factoids in there, like whether they were rare birds that had to be uh, confirmed by Florida Ornithological Society or if they were rare for ABA. Um, as far as I know, we're the first people to ever do that to actually give our list out, and especially to give our list out with all the evidence. Yeah. Um, however, we are being followed up by a main big year birder who yep. is three birds from breaking the record as of yesterday. Um, and he has a website where he has been in real time posting all of his birds for the whole year. So that's really cool. That, that's something we, we wanted to see change. You know, it's, a, it's an honor system, but we wanted to see people you know, really be able to put the proof out there. Yeah, document your species. And that's it. Um, these are just some fun photos from the year. And thank you so much for listening to our stories. Wow. So did you just, you know, at the end, you probably slept for a week, but you couldn't because you had to work. Right? No, we went birding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we went birding. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You have shared so many entertaining and somewhat uncomfortable and frightening <laughs> anecdotes yep. wow and just your relentless birders um i've yeah. never tried when did you switch and decide you were gonna make this a big year or try for a big year because you said at the beginning you you yeah you know, it was about mid-january when we hit yeah. our, our first kind of like goal was okay let, let's see if we get to 300 Mm -hmm. And then, like around January 26, it was like, wait a minute, do yeah. you want to just do it? <laughs> yeah, because that, that, that's a big commitment. Yeah, yeah. it's like, do you want to just do it because we don't know what we're getting ourselves into? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what yeah. happened. So, a couple of questions. Um, folks, uh, Kevin Baker wants to know what kind of photo equipment you use. And I was curious about the recording equipment you use. Okay. Um, you want to start with the recording? Okay, so I use a Tascam um, recorder. Um, I used to use a Marantz, and I will not look back from a Tascam because they it has great um, internal battery, um, which is something that when I was using a Marantz recorder, um, 
was an issue. I wouldn't be able to be out for more than two hours without now I, I'm walking around with a, a dead reporter. Whereas the Tascam has an internal and an external battery. So that's why I love it. Um, and as far as mics, um, I use a Sennheiser uh, ME66 mono mic. Um, that was my original mic. And then for Christmas, <laughs> I got a really nice parabolic mic, uh, mono mic as well from Wildtronics. Wow. And so that, when you use a parabolic mic, that changes your world. <laughs> okay, that's just, there's no other way to describe it. And it comes in different sizes. I have the large professional one, um, mm -hmm. but- For eavesdropping as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the good thing is that, oh yeah, we're not, well, <laughs> I'm not that interested in like humans. So <laughs> it kind of works out well for me because if I was, that recorder would be dangerous. Um, <laughs> so- You say kids are the darndest things. <laughs> oh yeah, we've heard some kids in camps at parks like, uh, I don't I think I want to record anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, the recording equipment. Um, and the yeah, if, you want, if you want a small, um, uh, they have smaller parabolic mics if you don't want like the big dish one. So uh, for photo equipment, we both have Nikon D610s. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought them used so that we could save money because we're poor biologists. Yep. Um, and we both have a 300 millimeter F4 um, which are the affordable 300 millimeters uh, used those like um, about $800 yeah. versus $3,000 new. Yeah. Um, and well, your photos are beautiful, obviously, you know, great photos. Yeah. yeah. And we use a COA scope. Yeah. Shout yeah. out to COA. Yeah. Part <laughs> way through the year, COA um, sponsored us and helped us get a COA scope as well as the uh, stimulus checks. <laughs> yeah, that helped. Uh, okay. <laughs> So yeah. someone, um, uh, let's see, Helen and Scott Lawrence uh, were asking if you could, Natasha, tell the, um, the, the name of your master's thesis again, the topic of that. Oh, um, so I'll just give you the general topic is basically I'm looking at how plant communities relate to bird communities. So um, more specifically in Mesic Flatwoods. So I'm looking at habitat structure, um, vegetation, um, plant species richness, and seeing, and also seasonality. So um, basically trying to see what is really the influencing factor um, with the relationship between plants and birds in Mesic Flatwoods. Right. And, mm -hmm. and do you all remember what is the bird, the name of the bird you saw at Perdido Beach? Somewhere. South Polar Skua. South Polar Skua. Got it. Um, folks are saying impressive photos of pelagics in rough sea conditions. <laughs> that was hard. Yeah. Yep, that was ridiculous. Uh, Chris Golia says, great recordings, especially the Chuck Will's widow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Um, awesome listening. Let's see. This is from Cynthia Marks. I could not identify birds apart most of the time. So I'm so impressed and thankful for your video report and recordings. Thank mm. you. I think that speaks to your um, uh, call for, for more integrity in, in the, the bird counts. Yeah. Mm. Um, from Sheila Calderon, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, Jenny Mauser, yes, thank you. So much fun. Excellent. Thank you for Maureen Swanson. More thanks uh, from Marilyn Levy. An awesome presentation. Fun stories. Thank you for sharing them. Uh, thanks. I like the little hints on many of the pages. So oh, <laughs> Yeah, the first person, first person. No. oh my gosh, we were like, we're putting these hints and everything, and no one's ever said anything about that. Well, there you go. That was from Alice Turner, and you know, obviously, oh, yeah. your experience is going to help anyone else because you had to live through it, right? And it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> remember the drama mean? Okay. Uh, that was. I've been to the Dry Tortugas. It's it's beautiful there, and um, yeah, wow. yeah. Like you were talking, Nastasha, about TV birds. I get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Paula Gutrell says I enjoyed your presentation and your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful presentation and enthusiasm and energy are amazing. <laughs> Super presentation. 
and Ann Wiley says, fantastic, you two. This is my second time watching your wonderful presentation. <laughs> wow, there's a super fan right there. <laughs> yes. You got to go with my mom. <laughs> Okay, let's see. And then Diane Park says, thank you. Great presentation, Cynthia Condor. I'd like the hints also. So there you oh, go. Yay. Yay. Yeah. And <laughs> Shelly Rosenberg, our Purple Martins gal says, awesome, fun presentation. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Lyons suggests um, that you should give presentation to school kids. Have you done that oh, or is that on no, your list? Actually. Not no, we haven't. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, not this. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, I mean, I, you've you've got a book in here. You've got a movie in here. <laughs> Maybe a graphic novel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wonderful. Let's here's an here's a third vote for the hints and, and great presentation oh. from Nancy Freeman. And Terry Sullivan loves your laugh, Natasha. Oh. Yeah. You Thank you. Have, you both have brought great energy and so much fun to this evening. We're so lucky to have <laughs> um, you here tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here because I know you must get a lot of requests to do this uh, presentation and um, I know you've done quite a few already. So thank you so much for sharing your time with yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun every yep. time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. Um, Scott, did you want to come on and say a few closing words? From your mom. <laughs> Give him a second to get his video going, to unmute. Start mute. Now I will start again. There so, you go. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you, Natasha and Gundy, for joining us tonight. That was a great and fun presentation. And Natasha, I love your laugh also. You were just, it was, it made me want to laugh every time you laugh. So that was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's contagious. And speaking of novels and books, and I, I agree the fact that you should write one and maybe do a movie. Our next presenter called Safina has written nine books and has also hosted, also hosted the PBS series Saving the Oceans, uh, which was in 2012 and 2013. So that's something you won't want to miss. That's next December 7th at 7 p.m. Again, Carl Safina, ecologist and author, and I should say uh, PBS, PBS documentary host. Uh, so please join us next month. We loved having everyone here tonight. Again, thank you. Um, thank you, Natasia and Gundy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. Thank you for your great questions. Have a great month. Get out there and bird and perhaps think about a big year it, the new year is coming <laughs> up and and you know it's uh, another chance to get out to to give you a reason to sleep in your car and sleep on beaches and get woken up by the police in the middle of the night and but really to see some great birds so anyway everyone have a great evening thank you for joining us and we'll see you next month Good bye night. everybody thank you bye thank you So Rich, did you stop the recording? <laughs>